everybody, welcome back to Exponential Finance, the podcast covering finance, technology and innovation, from our home in Japan and beyond. Franz Waldenberger has researched the Japanese economy since 1992, when he joined the German Institute of Japanese Studies, DIJ, as a senior research fellow, focusing on Japanese industrial organization, the employment system, and the financial system. Since 1997, as a professor for the Japanese economy at Munich University, Franz has extended his area of research to include corporate governance, Japan's international economic relations, and most recently, fiscal and monetary policy. In 2014, he returned to Japan to head the DIJ as its director. And now, please welcome Professor Waldenberger. All right, good afternoon, Franz. Welcome to the show. Very good to have you. And we want to talk about two things today. One mm. is, given that you're a distinguished economist, I'd like to get your perspective on the monetary policy here in Japan. And secondly, the driver for this conversation really was that you edited a book on the financial systems mm. in Europe and Japan. And so that would be the second part mm -hmm. of the conversation. Well, yeah, thank you for having me. Talking about uh, Japan's monetary policy, I think even for an economist, a trained economist, it's hard to fully grasp what's going on. I mean, already over the last 20 years or so, I mean, Japan has been trying to achieve 2% inflation. They uh, conducted extreme expansionary monetary policy, especially when uh, the present governor, Kuroda, took over in 2013. So the balance sheet of the Bank of Japan expanded extremely. And still, the consumer price index more or less flat. I think under normal conditions, if you uh, try to achieve a goal for almost 10 years, I mean, Kuroda explicitly stated the 2% goal. Before that, it wasn't so explicitly stated. But Kuroda said 2%, we want to achieve 2% inflation, and we do anything we can, of course, within the traditional monetary policy. There was never the helicopter money over Tokyo or Japan. So for 10 years, he was trying to achieve the 2% inflation target. When you look at the nine years, the average annual inflation rate was below 1%. Even after nine years, you haven't achieved your target, then for normal private business, I mean, nobody would be heading an organization where he in vain pursued a goal that he couldn't achieve. But it seems for monetary policy, there are different rules. <laughs> Normally, you would say either you don't have the right goal or you don't have the right instruments. And now what's also surprising is that the rest of the world is experiencing very high inflation. Japan finally achieved the 2% target over the last few months. I just compared the figures actually for a paper I'm writing. And if you look at the nine month period from September 21 to June 22, June 22 is the last monthly data that we have for Japan, a CPI, including all items. So including energy, including food, then over the last nine months in Japan, the CPI, the consumer price index, increased by 1.7%. In Germany, I think it was more than 6%. US was 8%. And the OECD average was even 9.1% over the same nine-month period. So it seems that Japan is in a different world. And to make sense out of this, so on the one hand, you have this very long period of expansionary really no historical precedent, expansionary monetary policy, not achieving the 2% inflation target. And on the other hand, you have inflation all around, hiking all around the world, and it doesn't happen or very moderately only in Japan. So you wonder what, what's happening here. And I'm trying to make sense out of it. I mean, one important reason, of course, is the demographics in Japan. So if you look at the monetary expansion by the Bank of Japan, they gave the money to the commercial banks the commercial banks normally, if they have cheap money, they want to lend it out to business. But Japanese business just doesn't need the money because they know, they see the population in Japan is declining. And so they are not expanding capacity if the domestic market is shrinking. And so what you actually see is that Japanese companies over the last few years, they invested more abroad than at home. So they don't need the money that the commercial banks want to offer them. So what do the commercial banks do? They put the money back to the central bank on deposits, their deposits with the central bank. So they have huge deposits with the central bank. So the money basically just travels from the, the central bank to the commercial banks and then back to the central bank. So it doesn't get into the, into the economy. There is no way to break out of this. 
So that's the demographics. At least this kind of puzzle can be partly solved by, by the demographic situation in Japan. The other puzzle I'm still trying to understand, I mean, there's one thing for sure is that as Japan is continuing this expansionary monetary policy, keeping interest rates near zero, near the zero lower bound, whereas in the US and Europe, the policy rates are raised, you get this interest rate differential between Japan and the rest of the world. No? So the rest of the world, higher interest rates, Japan still very low interest rates. And this interest rate differential, of course, that led to this depreciation of the yen, that weakened the yen. So now we have an interest rate differential, and this is more or less maybe in line with the expectations that in the future that the yen will appreciate. And this appreciation of the yen will compensate investors for the lower interest rate in Japan. Now, so if you are a US investor, you put your money to Japan, and then uh, you get less money. But if you expect the yen to appreciate, well, that will compensate for the lower interest rate. There is an appreciation, a yen appreciation expectation, which compensates the interest rate differential. And this appreciation expectation means that the prices in Japan will have to grow at a lower pace than the prices in other countries. So that would at least explain why, given the interest rate differential and the implied appreciation expectation, that the price level in Japan should not rise as quickly. Inflation should be lower in Japan than in other places. Of course, the absolute numbers don't add up, but at least the relationship should be something like that. For how long this can be true, I don't know. And there are certainly other factors that play into it. And if you look at the statistics about the corporate price index, the corporate price index has been 8%, 7%. You would expect this, you know, that be a pass through to the consumer price index. That hasn't happened. So there, there is a buffer somewhere. Of course, the low wages or that the wages don't pick up. A lot of question marks, <laughs> a lot of big question marks. We mm. have the July PPI numbers mm. this morning was like 8.6%. So you see that. Yeah, it's been 8, 7%. It's been very high for the last few months, but it just doesn't show up in the final consumer price index. Mm. And even if the long-term expectation is for yen appreciation, mm. and mm. many people have said already at the 125 level, so yeah. the yen is undervalued, the short-term effect mm. of this interest rate differential is that mm. the yen has weakened quite yes, substantially. Exactly. Mm. And there are people out there, I read like Jasper Colt's mm. blog, uh, who's been saying that you could get an overshoot mm. on the weak side as well, mm. and saying that 150, 160 mm. to the dollar mm. is not necessarily out of the question. It should be dramatic, even more dramatic shift even from where sure. we are right now. Sure. And also the weak yen should also actually push prices up in Japan because a weak yen means that import prices will be higher. Import prices in yen ne, will be higher. But still, we don't see it yet. So the pass through from higher import prices, from a weak yen, higher import prices to the consumer price index, the pass through from high corporate price hikes to consumer prices, we don't see it. Okay, there must be some structural peculiarities or it just takes more time. We don't know. At the same time, you see that many Japanese corporations still make profit. On the consumer side, Asai yesterday or mm -hmm. the day before had their earnings and mm -hmm. they were stellar. They were very strong. Yeah. And the kind of a, a byline of that was that they were able to raise prices mm -hmm. abroad, mm -hmm. kind of in line with the higher inflation, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they only announced so far in mm -hmm. Japan. So they will raise prices for beer in yeah. October. Okay. So they better drink more until then. Not in summer. <laughs> Not in summer. Well, they don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> annoy annoy their consumers. <laughs> so we haven't seen, to your point, we haven't seen those sides yeah, yeah. here yet, but maybe mm -hmm. they're coming then in the last quarter. I don't know. Your point was interesting to say, well, if you were in the private sector, mm -hmm. if you have a target and you miss it for nine years in mm -hmm. a row, mm -hmm. you're probably not in your job anymore. His term runs out next yes, year, so yes. he's gone anyway. Yeah. Two-part question. One is, is the relationship from the government to the BOJ, has it changed in your view now that Kishida is there? And do we expect continuity once Kuroda goes, or could there be a dramatic change in policy as it tied so much to his personality? Well, I think the change was from uh, Shirakawa to Kuroda, because Shirakawa was an academic. He had his own ideas about 
monetary policy and he wouldn't buy into this American economist groupment and others proposed, you know, you have to do everything to avoid deflation. He thought that the price development in Japan was, first of all, it was rather a symptom than a cause for Japan's sort of weak growth. He also thought that monetary policy was limited in what he could do about it. Kuroda, on the other hand, maybe he doesn't have this strong academic background in monetary policy. He was more like somebody to be used. It all depends. The government, given the fiscal debt situation, the government will need Bank of Japan that is cooperative. <laughs> the big question will be, and obviously Kuroda was very lucky to have avoided it, if really if prices go up and if interest rates go up, what happens to Japan's fiscal condition? And then, of course, there's a dilemma between monetary policy and fiscal policy. And the question is, what do I prioritize as a governor of the Bank of Japan, who is If you look at the the Bank of Japan Act, the Bank of Japan is independent. You might question that because many decisions, especially who is going to be governor, who sits on the policy board, these decisions are made by the government. But anyway, this could be avoided. In in the last nine years, it was harmonious. I mean, this expansionary policy targeting 2% inflation was something that was very much supportive for Japan's fiscal policy, which avoided to consolidate. The next person might confront this situation. I don't know about uh, what Kishida thinks. Uh, He will certainly not want somebody who is sort of an outspoken uh, monetarist or, you know, uh, hardliner maybe or pure monetary policy theory guy. He wants somebody to be more pragmatic and listening to the government. I have no idea who will be the successor, but they might go for somebody like Kuroda and not so much somebody Mm. like Shirakawa. In the interim, this year was the first time in a while, I think, that one read about hedge funds betting against the JGBs and shorting mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. Somewhere out there in the middle of Tokyo, there's a graveyard of all the hedge funds who've tried this over the years, right? Uh, I think we've been going on that also for 15, 20 years almost. At some point, it has to break, but whether this is the time... I think there's still very clever people in the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Japan who know what's going on and hopefully they are clever and responsible enough. So there's obviously at the moment there's no sense of crisis yet, no? neither in the government in the government nor in the Bank of Japan. I hope they are clever people who have good reasons for that. Otherwise we don't know. I mean as an outsider you and I'm not so much into this. I don't have my own macroeconomic model of Japan where I could simulate different scenarios. I just apply my economist common sense and that doesn't get me very far. There's a space to be watched and so we'll mm-hmm. see what happens over mm-hmm. next year. Let's uh, move on into the second part. Mm-hmm. The book you edited is The Future of Financial Systems in the Digital Age, which you said has been downloaded over 10,000 times already. It's mm-hmm. available through Springer Open Access, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. Originally, that was meant to be a conference, and then, yeah. then the pandemic came into this, and so you brought together experts in Japan and Europe mm-hmm. to basically look at this topic mm-hmm. from these both sides. Ultimately, what was your driver, your incentive to look into this deeper with this Mm -hmm. group of experts? Well, first of all, digitalization, it's happening. It's already happening also in the financial system. We have, especially with the smartphones, we have mobile payments. And of course, we have algorithmic trading dominating more and more financial markets, all kinds of financial products which are optimized uh, using digital technologies, computer algorithms, and so on. The whole discussion, of course, is dominated or has been dominated by what's happening in the US, what's happening in China. And we thought, well, there are other economies as well. And look at Europe, (laughs) the Eurozone, or look at Japan. What's happening actually in Japan, what's happening in the Eurozone, and how does that relate to China and US? I mean, the idea is always that both for digital transformation and for the financial system, that this is a global phenomenon. What's surprising when you look at the discussion about the varieties of capitalism, where people try to categorize different economic systems, how they differ in terms of how they implement capitalism, then a very fundamental category, a very fundamental element in the distinction between variants of capitalism is actually the financial system. Because despite the fact that the financial system is probably the most globalized, the institutions are still very national and the structures are still very national. What's globalized is the function, the functionality. So the functional level 
is of course globally integrated on a functional level but on the design level we still have characteristic distinct national institutions our expectation was also that of course these distinct national institutions also shape the digital transformation the way that these systems embrace digital transformation Partly we could see it, of course, it's very complex and it's also not so interesting to make these very high abstractions. So we wanted actually to go down and look at what, for example, the payment system in Japan, how is it changing? Japan and Germany, for example, are known to be cash lovers for whatever reason. In Japan, you can see that you go to a convenience store and then you want to pay. So you get all the options as a customer. You know, you can pay cash, you can pay with your Suica or Pasmo card. You can pay with ID, which is basically your credit card registered on your iPhone or smartphone. You can pay with PayPay, Alipay, or so you have maybe 20 choices. I mean, you go to a convenience store and when you pay, you can choose from 20 or something choices, maybe even more. It never counted them. The retail sector wants the Japanese customers to go digital. And in order to persuade them, they offer all the different possibilities. The article in our book on the Japanese payment system is that the uh, loyalty point system in Japan is so much advanced. And the loyalty points, which for me is something I hate loyalty points, because I think, why do you make things so complicated? Just offer me a better price. I don't want to follow up and check my points. And here at these points, here at these points, I can combine them. Oh, today is double and tomorrow is triple. The Japanese seem to love it and it's hugely used and some of these loyalty points can actually be used as currency. So the idea in this chapter is about how loyalty point system could help to digitalize the Japanese payment system. That's one interesting factor, aspect. Of course, at the moment, mobile payment is still, it's just the surface. The surface is digital, but at the end you have a bank account. So the big challenge really is getting a digital currency. And here we also see very different approaches, even within Europe, of course. We have countries, Sweden, and so they go very fast. Others are more reluctant. Of course, everybody's experimenting the digital currency. We have actually two chapters on digital currencies from the European perspective, one by somebody from the ECB and the other one more academic, but they also collaborate and work in the European Digital Currency Forum. So they're really sort of at the forefront of the development and they give a roadmap of digital currencies for Europe. In Japan, very different. In Japan, the BOJ, very conservative. Of course, they do experiments. They have a joint project with the ECB for some time now, but they follow. They don't commit. The interesting thing about Japan is that basically we have a private initiative here. And the author of the chapter, he's actually leading this initiative, the Japanese sort of digital currency forum. It's a consortium of private companies. They try want to build this distributed ledger technology-based infrastructure on which you can do all kinds of applications, can be connected to this infrastructure. And in the end, they hope that the Bank of Japan will somehow jump onto it. So it's privately driven, but of course, not just by single persons, but by industry. And so you see that given the political economic system, very different approaches are chosen, are taken in order to promote the digital transformation. I think it was for us a good experience and you learn a lot about what's going on, the similarities, but also the differences. Continuing from where you just ended, the current the consortium has added more members almost every month. I think they're like yeah. 80 corporate members or mm -hmm. so. It becomes really powerful. And compared to many central banks, I mean, they are in the weeds of pilots. So mm -hmm. they have industry-specific or use case-specific mm -hmm. pilots. Mm -hmm. They're really going out and starting to demonstrate this in a real-life mm -hmm. scenario, which many of the central banks are still thinking or maybe technical proofs <laughs> of concepts. Yeah. And as you said, they're going to build the infrastructure yeah. regardless. Mm. And then the Bank of Japan needs to make a decision. Do they build a parallel one mm. or does this become one? Right? Yeah, they, they, how they connect with it. Yes. Yeah. What is clear, the original idea of the distributed ledger technology was that you don't need trust from institutions. The trust is generated by the algorithm, by the system. But we know that this comes at a very high cost, very high energy cost <laughs> running the system. And so by having government or the state with its reputation and with the, its trusted institutions come back in, can sort of get the best of both worlds. 
and so that we have the all the benefits of uh, distributed ledger technology but at a very lower cost <laughs> because we can benefit from the public trust of course some very radicals would say never trust the government but uh, well <laughs> then you have to pay a high price <laughs> You also mentioned the point systems, and I think most of us have 10 point cards or so in, in the wallet, right? Because you need one for the JR shopping mall and, and so on. They kind of accumulate as you go along, and mm. suddenly you've got 10,000 points, yeah. which equates to 10,000 yen typically, and well, now we get a free dinner or something. Yeah. And yeah. Even for people like you and me who are not really into it, but <laughs> you go with the flow and the people who really focus on yeah, point yeah. katsu, yeah, people yeah. who maximize it as yes. in the triple points, five times points <laughs> days, then that's that's a day to go shopping. Yeah. Which in a way was a digital currency even before digital currencies came yes. to Japan, right? right? People are so used to it. And when the whole cryptocurrency discussion started, I ran by Miki Tani on saying mm -hmm. we've issued whatever it was at the time. I think it was already 2018 or so. He was mm -hmm. talking about one trillion Rakuten points that yeah. have been yeah, issued. Yeah, yeah. And if you could really make them like money used mm -hmm. everywhere, then they would own a large chunk of that ecosystem. <laughs> Definitely. It's an incredible ecosystem around these loyalty points, yeah. The other thing where you started I found interesting too, is like the, the national aspect mm -hmm. of the financial system. Mm -hmm. So I've looked at this a bit also from the big bank perspective. Mm -hmm. And over the last two years, if there was one bank that tried to be global, it was probably City from last century mm -hmm. when they started building it up. And over the last 24 months, they unwound all mm -hmm. of that. Right? They left so many Asian markets mm -hmm. behind and then really getting into maybe more wealth management in these mm -hmm. markets, but yeah. not like a global retail mm -hmm. banking mm -hmm is that from that perspective. Mm. And even MUFG had also regular travel in, in the US, but yeah. they sold Union Bank. So like giving that market behind, which always for Japanese being successful in mm. the US seems to have a, a very big attraction, <laughs> right? Macari trying this as well. But then now you get all the fintechs and the crypto folks, you get the payment companies that try mm. to be yeah, global. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the crypto exchanges trying to be global. So a bit interesting because, yeah, the traditional financial system mm -hmm. almost has withdrawn a bit more into the national stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now these new players trying to yeah. build a global franchise, mm -hmm. whether they will be successful once you build out and you have mm -hmm. the regulatory mm -hmm. pressure in all your markets, well, you, you it's hard can, to maintain. Right? Yeah, but you, you see, of course, you have re different regulatory frameworks. If you look at the Uber, I mean, they are in Japan, but they had to line up with the taxi companies here. It's, it's a different business model. No? So it all depends on how flexible the new companies are in adjusting to national institutions. Of course, there might be slightly also the other way that national institutions adjust to these new business models. But I think they are very rigid in a way. And if you look at Airbnb in Japan, how they struggled, also facing, of course, regulatory hurdles. There is always the tendency through globalizing businesses that consumer behavior, culture and stuff that all gets, you know, globalized, more standardized. But on the other hand, we still see very strong national institutions and customs and traditions, regulations. They will not disappear that quickly. And it could also be that actually technology makes it easier to let these differences survive because technology makes it easier to make adjustments, flexible adjustments. If you take language, people speak uh, different languages and you think, okay, in the future, everybody will speak English, of course, with different accents. But if these translation programs improve yeah, and on your smartphone, you just speak your language and, and the other person hears it in what other language you want, that reduces, of course, the pressure to harmonize languages and, and then different languages can equally survive next to each other. So technology might also have the effect to actually help differences to be maintained. That's a very interesting mm -hmm. point because put it in the context of the real interaction, let's say the verbal interaction, mm -hmm. right, rather mm -hmm. than a digital website of a mm -hmm. company and translating that because there is much more a component of culture on the websites, right? The Japanese websites look so much <laughs> different from a Western website. Yes. Well, actually translating the person-to-person -person yeah. communication yeah. Yeah. might be even easier than yeah. changing the whole website. Exactly, exactly. If you go to a Japanese website, every time I'm overwhelmed by the complexity. It's very different. If you compare Travel Rakuten, because probably travel website in Japan with uh, Booking.com, 
it's different worlds, different worlds. And it plays also a bit into the trust question, right? To build trust mm. with the Japanese consumer, mm. it's kind of what they expect, overabundance of information. We just want it more minimalist, I think, from a Western perspective. Yeah, yeah. They want to they have a lot of, lot of information on the spot. And also they love to choose and they love to have, you know, sometimes you get these travel plans in the Japanese context. You look at them and you see there's hardly any difference. Oh, this is cheaper, but it's just the same content as the other one. For Japanese, it's wonderful to discover that and say, oh, I picked the cheaper one. I think it plays a role also in the payment systems mm. because, yes, we do have whatever 40 plus options mm. or so. I think only Singapore has more in Asia, which is amazing. But most people, as you said, either stick to cash or maybe yeah. to the credit cards that they have already mm. in their pocket. The one, let's say, new player who really made an impact is PayPay. They spent 100 millions of mm -hmm. marketing dollar and incentive programs mm -hmm. to get to the 45 million users they okay. have today. That creates such a high barrier. While you have maybe 40 options, mm -hmm. but five might be actively used. If you were a global payment company that looks at Japan as a mm -hmm. startup and say, like, it's the third largest economy in the world, we want to get into this. Mm -hmm. The bar that pay pay set with all the money that they've spent, yeah. it's almost impossible to compete here now as, yeah. as a newbie. You need convenience. You need maybe something like the success of the iPhone. When the iPhone made it to Japan, Japanese mobile phones were more advanced. They had more functionality, but it was the design. It was the ease of use, uh, the interface, which was appealing. There's also the big success story of the automated gates at the train stations. I remember the first time I came to Japan, they were still clipping the tickets, the sound. The people were extremely good at clicking this and even checking tickets from the people. It was just amazing. And then how they shifted that, how they shifted that to these automated gates. And with that, the Suica and Pasmo came. That revolutionized a lot of things. That was a huge infrastructure innovation for Japan, which was not only for trains, but also for payments prepaid cards, basically. And you can have your Suica on your iPhone, or you could also have it on your Ketai before. In that sense, I mean, Japan was amazing. The other Galapagos example is, of course, iMode, or the Japanese mobile phone, uh, mobile services. Here, I think it was just the industry structure that was different. I mean, here you had the dominant mobile phone operator, and around the operator, you had this ecosystem which the operator controlled. In Europe, it was an open system. There was no central control. And maybe that's sort of the idea. The fundamental business structure was different. You had Suica on the iMode phone yes. in 2006, yes. a year before the iPhone came out. And exactly. the, the, the first iPhone was nowhere near what it is today. You, exactly. And you can external. still today, you can, with the KTI, with the old iMode mobile phone, you could receive radio, you could receive TV, all the functions the iPhone didn't have. In the beginning, people just used both. They had their Japanese mobile phone and they had the new iPhone. Maybe coming back to where we started mm -hmm. also with the positioning, just to round it out, one of the drivers of the book was mm -hmm. to highlight the Japan and, and European angle vis-a-vis -vis the US and China. Mm -hmm. Although China, of course, all the advancements they made in, in terms of cashless and mm -hmm. so on are still there, but mm -hmm. the, the companies like Alibaba, Tencent <laughs> get beaten up a mm -hmm. bit, so they get more centralized mm -hmm. under the government. What is the hope for Europe and Japan? Is there still space for a global ambition in your mind? Or is it simply that we're breaking into regional blocks at best and national mm. economies at worst? And that's mm. kind of the space where, you, mm. where you're playing in the future. Mm. Well, I think for finance, as long as we have national currencies, well, in Europe, we don't have a national currency, we have the euro. That's a standard that cannot be invaded unless you do something very wrong and basically you are, you are pushed out because nobody has any trust anymore in your currency and then they use other currencies instead. But as long as you have these national currency and currency systems, I think it will be nationally dominated. And then, of course, you can set the standards, you regulate the system. The question is where you get the technology from, licensing the technology from abroad. In the end, it's, it's not just who are the domestic players, but who is actually making money out of it. Now, how is the value added distributed? And of course, if you're not a technology leader, 
then uh, you might have to pay for what you're using. You're still saying, oh, that's all national, but actually the money goes abroad. I wouldn't be so much worried about it. I mean, if you look at, for example, how much Japanese companies earn from the iPhone, I mean, by producing core components, the technologies are so complex that I still believe the advantage of having a global system is, of course, a global division of labor. So there will be parts and niches for enough companies in all kinds of countries to participate in the game. And it becomes more and more global. I mean, the supply chains are more and more global in that. So uh, it's not easy to just say because Apple is dominating the smartphone market. It's not easy to say all money goes to Apple. No, it, it's more complicated than that. Maybe another transition coming if you talk to people who get all excited mm. about Web3 and the metaverse and so on. <laughs> but also then in the metaverse, we'll need many more chips. And like Sony, for example, has yeah. very good video chips and video exactly. recognition chips. So they might not dominate the metaverse as a whole, but they might have critical components that are in high demand. More than 15 years ago, I went to visit the Sony laboratory where they basically, they show their technology. It's amazing. At that time, what they had a digital recognition, visual recognition and cameras, you know, that could zoom in hundreds of meters. That was amazing at the time already. Japan has a lot of these a lot of these technologies. But I think the hype about metaverse and other things is that people tend to forget that we're still living in a world of scarce resources. If you want to create something new, you have to take it away from something old because the whole thing is, is limited unless you become more efficient. But just for reasons of entertainment, just that people want to be entertained and that it's fun and cool doesn't create the market for such uh, things. For the marketing people, it might be interesting. It might also be interesting for... I mean, we have a project here as well that looks into avatars as, as a way of inclusion, uh, people with handicap or people who are sick and stay in bed and through avatars they can participate. But that's not the metaverse. I mean, these avatars are then communicating in the real world with other people. So uh, robotics and so on, I think, especially in an aging society, can play an important role and a, and a sensible role. But I'm not sure whether we will all turn into metaverse. Great conversation. Thank you very much, Franz. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to the next book, and hopefully it's again available on Springer Open Access. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome.